Hallihallo. Welcome back to Adventures in Language. I'm your guide, Caitlin. In our last episode, we talked about languages that are harder or easier to learn for English speakers. But what if your native language is not English? Would you find the same languages hard or easy? In this video, we're exploring one of the reasons why language difficulty is not a one size fits all situation. Specifically, we're talking about how the languages you know influence the languages you're learning. If you're new here, let me introduce myself. My name's Caitlin Tagarelli, and I'm a linguist and head of research at Mango Languages. I have a PhD in linguistics and I'm a lifelong language learner and teacher. There is so much to learn about the science behind language learning, and I'm excited to be taking you on this journey with me. Are you ready? Let's get started. It probably makes intuitive sense that if the language that you're learning is similar to your L1, if it has a lot of similar vocabulary and grammatical features, or a lot of overlapping sounds, you'd have an easier time learning that language than you would if the language is very different from your L1. To a certain extent, this is true. But some of the ways that languages influence each other might not be what you'd expect. By definition, if you're learning a second language, you've already got at least one language under your belt. So it stands to reason that what you already know about that language would come into play when you start learning a new one. So how does this work? Let's take an example. Imagine that you're a native speaker of Spanish and you've decided to learn Portuguese. These languages are incredibly similar. Nearly 90% of their vocabulary is overlapping and they have largely similar grammatical features and sounds. The languages also originate from and persist in similar cultures around the world, like the Iberian Peninsula in Europe or in South America. In fact, when traveling in South America, I remember meeting many Spanish speakers from countries like Uruguay and Argentina who were able to converse with the Portuguese speaking Brazilians they met without actually speaking each other's languages. This means that in some cases, there's actually a level of mutual intelligibility between the two languages. Studies have shown that native speakers of Spanish can understand about half of spoken Portuguese and almost all of written Portuguese without ever taking a single lesson. When it comes to learning, Spanish speakers learn Portuguese about twice as fast as native English speakers, whose native language is not nearly as similar to Portuguese. While the numbers are a bit striking, none of this is really surprising, but here's something interesting. Spanish speakers learning Portuguese tend to get held up on some of the grammatical differences between the two languages. They're able to communicate meaning so early on in their learning process that they actually tend to overlook the differences in grammar and pronunciation. Let me pause here to give you a quick primer on language families. Much like a family tree, ancient languages have evolved into the languages that exist today, often branching off and forming new and different but related languages. Indo-European languages form one of the major language families, and these have branched out into smaller language families, like the Romance languages which includes Spanish and Portuguese. Romance languages have much more in common with each other than they do with languages in the other Indo-European subfamilies. Even within say the Germanic language family, language evolution has happened in such a way that Norwegian is more similar to Icelandic than it is to Dutch. And then the Indo-European languages overall have more in common with each other than they do with Sino-Tibetan languages like Mandarin or Afro-Asiatic languages like Arabic. Language typology is the study of similarities and differences in features between the world's languages. Now, while distantly related languages can have many features in common, the closer two languages are to each other on a language tree, the more typologically similar they're likely to be. When we talk about how languages influence one another, we're talking about cross-linguistic influences or language transfer. Early research in this area was based on the assumption that L2 learning was mostly a question of adjusting habits developed during L1 learning. Learners might experience positive transfer where learning is facilitated by similarities between the L1 and L2 or negative transfer where learners make mistakes because of differences between the L1 and L2. So how does this work in the wild? Say an English speaker wants to say, he ate five mangoes in French. A direct word for word translation of the sentence gets you, 
Il a mangé cinq mangues. And this is a perfectly correct French sentence, if perhaps a questionable dietary choice. This is an example of positive transfer. English and French have very similar word order. So what this learner already knows about English helps when it comes to producing this sentence in French. But if that same learner tried to rely on English word order to say something like, I miss you in French, they get it wrong because French uses a different sentence structure for this phrase. Both French and English speakers learning the other language often end up saying, you miss me instead of I miss you. This is an example of negative transfer. There are clear advantages for learners whose L2 is typologically similar to their L1. Instances of positive transfer are hard to measure. It's basically an absence of mistakes. But there are noticeable differences in learning rates, as mentioned earlier, for Spanish versus English learners of Portuguese. Finland is a fantastic place to study cross-linguistic influences because the country consists of lots of Finnish-Swedish bilinguals, many of whom start learning their second language, either Swedish or Finnish, around third grade and then go on to learn English as a third language. Swedish is a Germanic language that's very similar to English, whereas Finnish is not even in the Indo-European family and is very different from English. Native Swedish speakers have been shown to achieve high English proficiency at a much faster rate than native Finnish speakers, which has been attributed to a large overlap in vocabulary, grammar, and sound systems between Swedish and English. These differences in learning rate are more apparent at the early stages of language learning, and then they tend to level out at higher levels of proficiency. Some researchers have proposed that the most difficult difference for learners occurs when the native language has a single form for something, but the second language has multiple forms. For example, French has two high rounded vowels, as in tu and tu. Initially, English speakers perceive both of these sounds as the English U and struggle to form two separate categories for them. Spanish has two forms of the verb to know, saber and conocer. English speaking learners have a very difficult time learning the appropriate uses of these two verbs. However, both forms exist in other languages like French, Italian, and German. So this doesn't pose a challenge for speakers of these languages. Now, here's something to look out for. Language differences don't necessarily imply difficulty. In fact, if a language feature is very different between the L1 and L2, it might actually stand out to learners and be relatively easy to learn. This is especially true for a feature that's used very often or very rarely. For example, Arabic doesn't have a progressive tense like I'm going or she's writing. But this is a very frequent, salient construction in English that Arabic speakers actually master quite early. In this way, there can be a novelty effect, which facilitates learning language differences. Adding to the intrigue of cross-linguistic influences, a lack of mistakes doesn't necessarily mean that a learner has mastered a form. Learners might also choose, consciously or not, to avoid using forms that are different from those that exist in their L1. Language contains a lot of redundancy or different ways to say the same thing. So while English speakers tend to use phrasal verbs like come in or shut off, L1 Hebrew speakers whose first language does not have phrasal verbs tend to prefer the accurate but less common one word alternatives like enter and stop. While not errors per se, this kind of production does not reflect native speaker usage, and in this way, it's actually evidence of language transfer. Interestingly, how a learner perceives the difference between their L1 and L2 also plays a role in cross-linguistic influence. That is, if a learner thinks that their L1 and L2 are typologically similar, they might not notice the differences and therefore won't even realize that they should be learning something. Grammatical gender, that is how nouns can be masculine or feminine, is a tricky concept for English speakers learning a language like German. Italian speakers whose native language has grammatical gender might find it easier to learn this feature in German. However, they might be thrown off by the fact that German has three genders instead of two, or that German and Italian can assign different genders to the same noun. For example, the word for key is feminine in Italian and masculine in German. 
What if you know multiple languages? How does this influence learning your L3? First of all, there's clear evidence that knowing multiple languages facilitates learning an additional language. Beyond the positive transfer that you might expect from simply having more cognates and grammatical features to draw on, it's also likely that you've developed and honed language learning skills and strategies that you can put to use when learning a new language. Interestingly, multilingual learners are more likely to draw on a language that's more typologically similar to their L3, regardless of whether that's the L1 or L2. So both Finnish Swedish and Swedish Finnish bilinguals tend to rely more on Swedish when sussing things out in English. This phenomenon is referred to as typological primacy. However, the L2 does tend to exert some more influence on the L3 because they both put the speaker in the mode of speaking a foreign language. Well, there you have it, how the languages you know influence the languages you're learning. To recap, first, the languages you know do influence the languages you're learning. If your languages share a lot of similar features, you're likely to get a boost. If they're very different, you'll probably encounter some more challenges. However, sometimes the opposite's true. Number two, cross-linguistic influences are often categorized into instances of positive transfer where learning is facilitated by similarities between the L1 and L2, or negative transfer where learners make mistakes because of differences between their languages. Third, how a learner perceives the languages they learn can actually influence the extent of language transfer. And finally, knowing multiple languages facilitates learning additional languages, and the typology of the languages you know is likely to have more of an impact than the order in which you learn them. If you like this video and you want to learn more about the science behind language learning, make sure you subscribe to our channel. Be sure to check out the description for this video for some free materials on cross-linguistic influences. Thanks for listening. Tschüssi!